Yeah, g'day, and welcome back to my little lathe channel where I've been retrofitting this lovely Swiss Schoblin 125 CNC lathe with Linux CNC. Now, last week I got most of the control panel finished, but not having the three label tags for these three encoders makes it look kind of messy. So let's get those done. Now these are going to need to be about 30, so I'll just go slightly oversized so I've got something to trim down. Now I want to avoid any distortion on my pieces of thin sheet metal, so I'll cut them out with an angle grinder. Right, let's get these round. I made one extra, which I think is a bit too small, but I can use that for testing the engraving. See this, the monitor comes on for like maybe a second and then goes off again. I've been told that's probably an interference issue, an EMI problem on the HDMI cable. Root cause of the issue is this distance here. I wanted to keep the housing as compact as possible, so I moved the monitor pretty close to this edge. And the reason I was able to do that was because I found this HDMI ribbon cable where it has an extremely compact connector. And unfortunately, because I designed around this connector, I now no longer have space to put in a normal, better shielded connector. So I'm gonna have to try and make this work. I'm gonna need to shield that, so let's have a go at adding some shielding. Because the little PC I'm using only has DisplayPort, I'm also having to use a DisplayPort to HDMI adapter. Probably also doesn't help anything. So I got a bit of braid, and it is long enough. So let me see about if I can insert this HDMI cable into here and let's see if it makes a difference. I'm pretty sure with cables like this that the metallic and socket housing is part of the earthing system so I'll connect the braid just to one end of that. Another suggestion was to get some sort of a like copper or insulating foil or something and put that on the cable. If I can't get this to work, that'll be the next attempt. But now before I do anything drastic, like soldering in connectors or anything, let me just try taping this into position to see if it's going to do anything. I'll put some insulation over the actual HDMI wires and connector because I don't want anything shorting off this braid. All right, let's try this monstrosity. Okay, well, it's sort of staying for a bit. Nope, there it goes again. Okay, so that's with the cable hanging out the back of the controller. So it does seem to be an issue with the shielding of the HDMI cable. Brass Pata, thanks very much for pointing that out. I think I'll leave it hanging out the back for today's session. If that is going to work stably, then I'll pull the cable back out and solder the shielding correctly. Is it better to solder the shielding to both ends? What do you guys think? Give the 
just a little bit of oil. Oops, I guess I over oiled that a bit. It's quite a good system pumping too much. It just comes out under here, so it doesn't hurt anything. It just gets it all a bit greasy. Jogging override and our jogging joystick. Oh, this is nice. I guess we can just use our little, this one. Okay, I didn't think of this. To select the cycle tab with the touch screen, I gotta get my finger right up into there. But my bezel is 2.7 millimeters tall and square, and I can't get my fat finger in there. And I don't know if there's a way to move the mouse with just a keyboard. Okay, temporary workaround. I'm glad that's at an angle that it doesn't just slide straight off. I can select my cycles. Those lathe macros were programmed by Andy Pugh, and he's one of the developers of Linux CNC and definitely one of the top users. He put out a really interesting video this week using Linux CNC to cut a three-lobed Capto tool holder. You know, there's been a lot of discussion in the last week about that door plug which flew off the Alaska Airlines 737-9 Max. Those door plugs are pretty uncommon on passenger airliners, but they're pretty common for freighters. Effectively what it is, is just a door which has had all of the latching and slide activation mechanism replaced with some bolts to prevent the latch mechanisms backing out. Okay, they haven't all cleaned up yet, but my target diameter is 30. It sounds like those door plugs are fitted by Spirit Aero systems when they manufacture the fuselage. But it's the kind of access, it's easy to see them assuming that Boeing removes them again in Seattle for final assembly access. You know, I just realized that I didn't actually check whether that tool's zeroed correctly. Oh yeah. Since I've been watching a couple of click spring videos, I better make these look nice, huh? Whoops, that was silly. Just wore a hole through my finger. Mail time. This box has come in from Stefano in Illinois. Wow, now that is a lot of end mills. Looks like there's some long ones. Yep. Oh, double-ended, cool. I think there's three different sizes there. There's the long ones, the short ones, both about 3 16th, I guess. Oh, it's written on the end, 3 16th and 5 30 seconds. And then a couple of bigger ones, which are half inch. So thanks very much for all of those, Stefano. Um, it's probably gonna take me twice as long to destroy them all because they're double-ended. I think everybody's hinting I really need to use the mill more, don't I? Right, I'm going to need a sacrificial tooling plate. Doesn't really matter where I put the part, so I'll just zero it there. Right, next up, poke a 4.2 hole through it and tap it M5. As the big aircraft manufacturers have moved from doing all of the final assembly themselves to outsourcing major sub-assemblies to tier one vendors, defining what the interface is between a tier one vendor and what needs to be done on the final assembly line in, in this case, Renton, must be incredibly difficult to manage. What all involved will now be doing is a root cause investigation, because it makes no sense just to go, okay, the bolts weren't installed, let's put bolts in. Were the bolts missed because a job card fails to call out installation of the bolts? in which case change the process. Or were the bolts missed because a new employee was on the job and hadn't been taught how to you know, follow the system properly? Training. Maybe the guy who was supposed to install the bolts was doing it at three o'clock in the morning on his third night shift and was having stress at home, 
maybe in the middle of a divorce, in which case you're looking more at the whole human factors aspect. Or the bolts missed because the organization's got a bad culture and no one really cares that much. Cultural issue. Really tough to change. Really tough to adjust. As with any aviation accident, there's always more to it than just the obvious. Right, here's my test piece. A couple of days earlier, the Haneda accident with the A350 landing on the Dash 8 seems to reveal a classic accident chain. The Dash 8 crew was on a disaster relief mission, so you can imagine there was a lot of task fixation. The taxiway stoplights were out of action. The controller told them they were number one, although that was number one to go and not number one for the runway. When they entered and lined up, the co-pilot probably would have looked for approaching traffic, but on such a busy runway there's always like a string of pearls, there's always approaching traffic, and it's not that easy at night to determine whether an aircraft's close or far away. After a string of mid-air collisions in like the 70s and early 80s, a technological solution was mandated, TCAS. With this Narita crash being very similar to the Tenerife crash back in the, I guess, the 80s, I would assume that the mandate for runway collision avoidance, which has already been developed, will probably be uh, accelerated. Okay, that was a wee bit too conservative with the cutting parameters. But still, it shows that it's going to work, so that's good. So those two accidents back to back in the first days of January 2024 have driven a lot of media attention. Let's hope from here aviation fades back out of the media. We could clean down with some acetone. Well, I've had a bit of a play around with whether it's better to blue the part first and then add the white paint, or add the white paint and then blue it. And I think it's better to add the paint first, so I'll do that. Let that dry. I wonder if I screwed up something on the toolpath because the spindle seems to be engraved deeper, the same depth as the as the wedge, whereas feed and jog are not as deep. I'm using this stuff to blue the steel. Okay, well they look reasonably legible. I've now neutralized the bluing compound with water, so last up just a bit of oil on them. Right, done, let's install them.
I'm glad I did that because that's the sort of detail where you either do it now or in 10 years you've still got something temporary. <laughs> well using the lathe showed that the HDMI cable was the problem. By moving around I could find a spot where it works okay. So let's make this permanent. I guess I just solder the braid onto the end. Okay well no idea how you're supposed to do this but by winding a bit of wire around there and then folding the braid back on it, it sort of looks a little bit tidier. This might not be the right soldering iron for this job. It's a nice soldering iron though. It's USB-C powered. Heats up really fast and it's got a motion sensor in it so every time you put it down it cools down and as soon as you grab it it starts heating again and it heats up within seconds. Right, well, I'm going to call that good enough. Don't know how well it actually bonded, but I don't want to melt my connector. Okay, well there's my finished cable. I'll get it reinstalled and see if it works even better now that it's well terminated. Right, well that cable does seem to be working more reliably now, which is a good thing. I've finished off my markings, so that's another good thing. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.